our modern day-to-day -day lives are made of countless interactions with the objects we encounter. From the tiniest particles to the biggest structures. Join us as we explore the inside workings of the world around us. This is Inside Things. Piano. Did you know that pianos are in fact two different kinds of instruments in one? It's a string instrument because the sounds are produced with the strings. But first, these strings have to be hit in order to produce sound. So in this way, it's a percussion instrument too. Let's take a look at how the piano makes sound. The key of the piano is a wooden lever with one side longer than the other. When you press down the key, the opposite end of the lever, which is hidden inside the case, forces a felt-covered hammer to press against the piano strings, producing a musical note. At the same time, at the very end of the lever, behind the hammer, is the damper. When you release the piano key, the hammer and the damper fall back down again. The damper is what rests on top of the string to keep it from vibrating, ending the musical note. Most of the keys on the keyboard usually hit two or three strings simultaneously when you press them for a richer and louder note. Many factors affect the sound it produces. Underneath the strings is a large piece of wood called the soundboard, which makes the sound louder or softer. When the strings vibrate, the soundboard also vibrates in sympathy. This is called resonance. The soundboard is what amplifies the sound coming from the strings. The lid of the piano helps with volume too. Sound travels upward, and when it hits the lid, it reflects out towards the audience. This is the reason the best seat at a piano concert is at the right side of the pianist. Aside from its 88 keys, the piano also has three pedals that can control how loud or soft the sound will be and how long it will last. The leftmost pedal is called the soft pedal. When pressed, the hammers that play the notes shift slightly to one side, so it hits fewer strings, thus making a softer sound. The middle pedal is called the sostenuto pedal. It temporarily deactivates the dampers for the notes you're playing at the same time, so the sound lasts a bit longer. The rightmost pedal is called the sustaining pedal. When this is used, all the dampers are raised up in the air, so all the notes last longer. As with all string instruments, lower notes require longer strings than higher notes. In the piano, the bass strings for the low notes on the left-hand side of the keyboard have to be longer than the treble strings for the high notes on the right-hand side. Sunscreen How does sunscreen protect your skin from the damaging rays of the sun? Sunscreen combines organic and inorganic chemicals that filter the light from the sun so that less of it reaches the deeper layer of the skin. It functions similarly like a screen door, where only little light penetrates, but not as much as when the screen door isn't present at all. Sunscreens usually contain sunblock as part of its active ingredients. The two are in fact different things. Sunblocks, on the other hand, protect the skin by reflecting or scattering the light away so that it doesn't penetrate the skin at all. The reflective particles in sunblocks usually contain zinc oxide or titanium oxide. In the past, it's easy to tell when one is using it by simply looking. Because sunblock whited out the skin literally. But today, not all sunblocks are visible because the oxide particles are smaller. Now, which part of the sun's light do sunscreens protect the skin from? 
the portion of sunlight that is filtered are the ultraviolet radiations. There are three types of ultraviolet light. The UVA, which penetrates deeply into the skin and may cause cancer and early skin aging. The UVB, which tans and burns the skin. And the UVC, which is completely absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. How are these ultraviolet rays blocked by sunscreen? It's the organic molecules in the sunscreen that absorbs the ultraviolet radiation and releases it as heat. PABA, or para-aminobenzoic acid, and cinnamates absorb the UVB rays, while the benzophenones and the E capsules absorb UVA rays. The anthranulates absorb both the UVA and UVB rays. Meanwhile, the SPF sunscreens stand for Sun Protection Factor. It's the number that determines how long one can stay exposed to the sun's rays before getting sunburnt. Remember that sunburns are caused by UVB rays, so the SPF only indicates protection from UVB rays and not the UVA. Although the particles contained in most sunblocks can reflect both UVA and UVB rays. Also, the skin has a natural SPF, which depends on how much melanin one skin contains or how darkly pigmented the skin is. Braces Braces are often prescribed by dentists for patients with crooked teeth and other dental irregularities such as a misaligned bite. While braces are the most common solution, in some cases, a removable retainer is all that's needed, while surgery may also be recommended for extreme cases. Braces work by applying continuous pressure to your teeth for over a period of time, so that your teeth moves in a specific direction. As the teeth move, the bone changes shape as pressure is applied. Braces are made up of the following components. Brackets are the small squares placed to the front of each tooth. These act like handles, holding the arch wires that move the teeth. Brackets may be made of stainless steel or tooth-colored ceramic or plastic. The orthodontic bands are stainless steel, clear, or tooth-colored materials cemented to the teeth, wrapping around each tooth to provide an anchor for the brackets. Spaces are the separators that fit between the teeth in order to create a small space before the orthodontic bands are installed. Arch wires are attached to the brackets and act as tracks to guide the movement of the teeth. These can also be made of stainless steel or be clear or tooth colored. Ties are the small rubber rings or the fine wires that fasten the arch wire to the brackets. A buckle tube is located on the band of the last tooth which holds the end of the arch wire securely in place. Tiny elastic rubber bands, called ligatures, hold the arch wires to the brackets. Springs can also be placed on the arch wires between the brackets. These can push, pull, widen, or tighten the spaces between the teeth. Elastics or rubber bands are attached to hooks on the brackets and are worn between the upper and lower teeth in different ways. The bands apply pressure to move the upper teeth against the lower teeth to achieve a perfect fit of individual teeth. These are the most common and basic parts of braces. It consists of numerous parts that may be used depending on the patient's case.
keys or lock. Yale locks have been common household items. We rarely stop to think about how these work. One of the most common kinds of lock is the cylinder pin tumbler lock, used in padlocks and Yale door locks. This mechanism is based on the discovery made in ancient Egypt during the mid-19th century, led by American inventor Linus Yale Jr. Because of his winning invention, the Yale Company was named after him. Now let's take a look at how locks work. The heart of a lock consists of a sturdy metal cylinder that can swivel inside its metal housing. When the correct key is inserted, the cylinder can be turned freely, opening the lock. Without the key, or when the wrong key is used, the cylinder remains in place and refuses to turn. The lock stays shut. This cylinder is held in place with metal pins inside. Inside the lock, there is a series of thin metal pins that run down from the housing into the cylinder locking it in place. There are two separate sets of pins, an upper set and a lower set. Then there's a small set of springs right just above the pins to keep them in place. Now, how do these all work? Without a key, the upper pins drop down from the housing and into the cylinder, locking it in place. And how does it open? As you can see, with the key's jagged edges, every key has a slightly different profile of raised areas, so that it fits only the specific lock it's made for. The wrong key cannot fit in the lock in any way. So, when the jagged edge of the right key is inserted into the lock, it pushes the pins upward against the force of the springs. The further the key is pushed, the more pins it lifts. And with the right key in place, the upper pins are all pushed just above the edge of the cylinder. At this point, these are no longer locked to its housing. Finally, when the key is turned, there's no longer anything that stops the cylinder rotating. So the lock is then opened. Fire Extinguishers How do fire extinguishers work? To understand this, we must first know how fires are sustained. First, it needs three basic things. Heat to sustain itself and propagate. Fuel to keep burning and oxygen, which is essential for the combustion of fuel. Without just one of these three present, the fire will die. This is the basic principle followed by how fire extinguishers were crafted. There are three types of fire extinguishers commonly used today. First are the water extinguishers. Water is the most commonly used fire extinguishing agent. It works by removing heat from the surface, thus killing the fire. In water extinguishers, compressed air pushes water to come out of the tank and be sprayed on the fire. Gas extinguishers are mainly carbon dioxide extinguishers. These contain high-pressure carbon dioxide in liquid form. When carbon dioxide is released on the fire, the gas expands greatly, thus 
reducing the fire's temperature. Plus, carbon dioxide is heavier than air, so it settles down. This means that carbon dioxide fire extinguishers work by removing heat and also oxygen supply to the fire. The last type are the dry chemical extinguishers. These work by eliminating the fuel supply of the fire. When dry chemical powder is sprinkled around the fire, the powder forms a layer on top of the fuel and cuts it off from the fire. And as the powder is non-flammable, the fire no longer gets the fuel it needs to sustain itself. These are the three most common types. But there are many other fire extinguishers designed for more specific types of fires. Vacuum Cleaners Ever wondered how a vacuum cleaner works? It works similarly with how you sip your drink through a straw. When you suck the air out, drink from the container takes its place in the straw. This is because you've created a space of empty matter in your mouth. And because matter has a tendency to occupy space, the drink will move upward and into your mouth, as long as you continue to sip. Now, let's begin with the steps of how a vacuum cleaner cleans the floor. A vacuum cleaner houses a motor that runs dependent on electricity. This motor is what spins the vacuum's fan rapidly. The fan is made up of angled blades that push air up towards a bag. Air is then moved from under the fan away, leaving an area of low air pressure right below the fan and near the floor. Remember that air always moves from areas of high pressure to comparatively low pressure. The vacuum cleaner works via this process. Now, the vacuum cleaner has already created an area of low pressure near the floor. Air from the floor will now move in to fill the space. Very small particles of dust and dirt will then be lifted by the low pressure area. Air will also take larger loose particles of dirt with it because of friction. In addition to the fan, vacuum cleaners also have a rotating brush that sweeps the floor. Its purpose is to loosen the trapped dirt that's stuck in hard-to-clean spots, such as the carpet. It should free the dirt from bristles and lift them in an area where they can be easily sucked up into the vacuum cleaner's porous bag. Now, the vacuum cleaner has already sucked in air and dirt particles. These will continue moving upwards, entering the porous bag. The bag should be porous enough to allow air to pass through easily, but dense enough to trap dirt, dust, and other large particles. So air exits the bag and leaves the dirt particles trapped inside. With only a simple mechanism, the vacuum cleaner is able to clean the floor. Reflexes What are reflexes? These are the involuntary actions of your body when it responds to stimuli. In other words, these are your automatic reactions. Reflexes happen even when you don't think about it. These are natural reactions we are all born with. In fact, reflexes are signs of being in good health. 
That's why doctors often test for normally working reflexes. Reflexes are built-in safety mechanisms that actually help keep you safe and healthy, protecting your body from harmful things. Take for instance your immediate reaction when your hand comes in contact with a very hot object. Notice that even before your brain can even register the fact that what you've touched was extremely hot, your body has already reacted. This is because you have a natural reflex to remove your hand from the source of heat. Another reflex is the blinking of the eye. Blinking is a reflex that protects your eyes to keep dust and other foreign particles to enter it. And at the same time, keep your eyes moist. Other reflexes are sneezing and coughing. These happen when irritating particles enter your breathing passageways. Both sneezing and coughing help protect your air passageways by keeping unwanted particles out. There's also what's called the patellar reflex. When you go on a checkup, oftentimes the doctor taps your knee with a rubber hammer. What happens next? Without thinking, your leg automatically kicks or straightens. The doctor is simply testing your patellar reflex, which is also known as the deep tendon reflex or DTR. In this checkup, the doctor is in fact tapping your patellar tendon. The tap causes you to stretch the tendon, which in turn also stretches the thigh muscles connected to it. This message is sent to your spinal cord, which in turn immediately sends back a signal for your muscles to contract. This is why your leg kicks. There are many other reflexes. As for your patellar reflex, it is important because without it, you won't be able to balance and stand straight. This is because the strong pull of gravity can actually cause your knees to bend slightly. But your patellar reflex keeps your knees in place, so you remain standing. There you have it! Another episode down the drain! Still, there are countless more things to explore. Join us next time as we look and know more about the world around us. See you next time on Inside Things.